I give this talk uh, once a year, just as a highlight, a, a point of discussion for the management of intravascular catheter-related infections. And I think it's important because we literally deal with these every day, those of us who are doing inpatient uh, consultative management. Um, so why do they matter? Uh, because we see them every day in our practice. Also, um, there's a quarter million cases of catheter-related bloodstream infection annually in the U.S. Um, a large proportion of these are related to intensive care units. Um, you know, we know that perhaps now more than ever before, uh, because of the increasing need to move the management of patients out of the hospital that we rely on, intravascular catheters like PICC lines, for example, and ports, implanted tunnel catheters more than ever. And uh, this is an active area of infection prevention because we all recognize that these catheters can lead to, prevent, to infection if they're not properly managed. Now, I was looking, I was updating this talk and I was looking for um, anything that's been new in recent years. So this is new since 2015. The CDC has now introduced the term laboratory confirmed bloodstream infection. Um, this is to differentiate uh, the, uh, the definition of central venous line associated bloodstream infection with those that have some culture uh, validation based on the lab. So uh, you have to have at least one of these present of these three criteria. A uh, patient has a recognized pathogen cultured from one or more blood cultures and the pathogen is not related to an infection at another site. So obviously if we saw MRSA bloodstream infection and that came back from blood cultures and the um, you know, the, and, and the patient had a central venous catheter, we would suspect that and that would meet the criteria. Um, now, if a patient has systemic symptoms, fever, chills, or hypotension, and the pathogen's not related to an infection in another site, um, if the organism is a common commensal, uh, in those cases has to be present for two or, or more blood cultures. So for instance, if you have a uh, staph epi, which is, we recognize as a common commensal, has to be present in two or more uh, blood cultures, certainly uh, associated with uh, some systemic symptoms or signs. That's the second one. And then the third criteria involves infants. So I won't dwell on that as much, but you can read it. There's also a special subset called MBI, LCBSI, or LCBI, Mucosal Barrier Injury Laboratory Confirmed bloodstream infection, and that's for patients who are uh, allogeneic stem cell transplant recipients with advanced graft-versus-host disease who have uh, problems with their mucosal barriers, and they have a catheter infection uh, with at least one blood culture growing an enteric organism. So we see that in our practice, but especially at, at Moffitt. So be advised of those uh, new CDC-supported terms. So we recognize um, the different types of uh, implanted venous catheters, right? You have uh, your short-term catheters, including peripheral IVs, midlines, and uh, triple lumen or CVC catheters. Um, seems like uh, back in, uh, you know, when I first started practicing in the 1990s, uh, we didn't have a lot of PICC lines. There was just a lot of triple lumen catheters or CVCs, high rate of infection. Um, and uh, uh, again, the triple lumen catheter now it seems to be just confined to uh, an intensive care unit setting, at least at our facility. And then we have our long-term implanted venous catheters. You all know these uh, PICC lines, Hickman's or uh, Grishon catheters, they're called and implantable ports. So um, think, of, think of things in, in these categories. So, um, you know, the, the importance of central venous catheter associated bloodstream infections has been known about for ye years. And uh, so there's been an active effort to reduce infection rates with these catheters as their use increases. And um, so, and there has been some success. For example, in the decade of the 2000s, there was a uh, reduction in 
uh, the incidence in ICUs that was pretty significant. Um, but you know, we see infections in uh, outpatients. We see infections in uh, patients on regular hospital wards. It's not just a phenomenon of ICUs. Um, according to the SCOPE database, ICU-related uh, CVL infections constitute about a half, 51%. And you can see the breakdown there um, uh, as listed. PICC line's about a third. Um, CVC, central venous catheters, triple lumen catheters, um, certainly have a much higher incidence of infection than, than other uh, tunnel catheters. And the, the reason is obvious because, um, you know, you have uh, a, a catheter which is not tunneled and entering in, mo in many cases directly into um, a large vessel, either in the subclavian area or the internal jugular area without a, a long tract to protect the, uh, the patient from introduction of infection. We can think about these special groups uh, that have intravascular catheter-related infections. Dialysis patients, we all know intuitively, are very commonly associated with infections. Burn patients have unique uh, morphology and, and challenges related to their impaired skin barrier. TPN patients receiving long-term parental nutrition have their own risk factors. And we, we know intuitively from managing our patients at Moffitt that oncology patients uh, through uh, the, lo the loss of intact uh, mucosal barriers, through immune compromise, and also through their pro prolonged usage of, of uh, implanted catheters are at high risk. These are some other risk factors. Chronic illness, obviously, is uh, an immunocompromised state in itself. Stem cell transplantation we talked about earlier. Um, patients with uh, so-called high-grade neutropenia, that's uh, a absolute granulocyte count of less than 100. <clears throat> also malnourished patients. <clears throat> Excuse me, parental nutrition, prior bloodstream infection, extremes of age, and anyone with compromised skin integrity. We also want to think about the duration of catheterization. Uh, we know intuitively that some patients with implanted ports keep their port for three or three or four years, some even longer than that, and never have infections. Um, you know, port. I think we'll all acknowledge that implanted ports are probably the most durable tri type of of uh, central venous catheter with the with the uh, lowest risk of infection. We also want to think about the type of catheter material, how it was inserted, where it was inserted, and also the experience of the implanter. We know that uh, someone who is experienced at implanting catheters, who uses uh, maximum sterile barriers and maximum infection precautions, that combination has the lowest risk of infection. So let's take a look at the uh, morphology of the catheter and think about the different ways that infection can be introduced uh, associated with a central catheter. They're actually um, uh, four different ways. So who wants to suggest a first? What's, what's a way that infection can be introduced into the system? So, yeah, so we, we know that uh, catheters have a component of their, um, their physiology that involves um, going through the skin into a blood vessel, right? So if you have a short tract there, and let, this is a, obviously a CVC, a triple lumen catheter, you can see that the distance between um, where the catheter enters the skin and the vein is very short. That's true with peripheral IVs as well, of course. And then you have tunnel catheters, which actually have a prolonged subcutaneous tract. Um, again, the longer the, the physical distance between the vessel and the um, exit site of the catheter, the lower the risk of, of infection because those bacteria have to migrate along that tract. So one way that infection can be introduced is through the catheter insertion site, right? So that's one. What's another? So the, the hubs, right? So the catheter hubs are another way. And we know that uh, if you have, um, if you're a patient in the intensive care unit and you happen to have a central venous line placed, 
you have three catheter hubs. Uh, maybe medications are being connected and disconnected constantly. Those hubs are being handled uh, often. And if there's not proper care of those hubs, infection can be introduced. So very good, that's another one. Now what's, uh, what's the, th the third major one here that we haven't covered yet? Hematogenous, Hematogenous excellent. So uh, microbes can uh, be introduced into the bloodstream. Let's say this is a neutropenic patient with loss of intact mucosal barriers. They get a bacteremia and then they seed the catheter hematogenously um, along where the sheath is. Um, usually there's a, um, there's a fibrin sheath around where the catheter is in the vein. Bacteria can get under that sheath. They can uh, uh, mature, they can develop a biofilm and they can protect themselves from infection. Now um, there's one more that we haven't considered and what is that? So the infusate, right? So contamination of the infusate, we see that sometimes patients who receive, for instance, uh, TPN and they get candida infections through the infusate. There may be um, other contamination. Sometimes a patient may be getting uh, blood, uh, blood products that can be contaminated, other times um, other medications. So those are the four ways that uh, contamination can occur. So we can look at these examples and think about risk factors, uh, which are highest. So at the site, as far as where the catheter is located, which site has the highest risk? Is it femoral, internal jugular, or subclavian? So femoral, right? And what is number two probably? IJ, right? Because we see a lot of patients in the intensive care unit, they're uh, recumbent, they're laying on one side, some of them, you know, at literally will drool down into their catheter entry site. We see that sometimes. How about um, uh, the catheter use? Which has the highest risk? Antibiotics, hemodialysis, hyperalimentation. So hyperalimentation, definitely. Hemodialysis, um, I think those are, are definitely the top two. I, I think we could have a debate about which one is most likely, but certainly antibiotics would have the lowest risk. Um, how about barrier precautions? Submaximal versus maximal. Sub, so submaximal would have the highest risk. I remember when I was a, a young budding infectious disease doctor after finishing my fellowship and I went to a small hospital where I practiced for six years and um, I was the only infectious disease doctor so they asked me to do infection control. So I spent many hours with uh, our infection control nurse talking about how we can convince our surgery colleagues to do maximum sterile barriers because some of these guys were a little more crusty, they were older, and it never occurred to them you had to fully glove, gown, and mask um, and use very sterile techniques when you place a central venous line, and they weren't doing that. Um, so there's no doubt, maximal barrier precautions has the lowest infection risk. Um, how about tunneled versus non-tunneled? We talked about that earlier, right? Everybody knows that tunneled catheters have a lowest infection risk. Non-tunneled catheters have the highest. And how about bare versus coated? How about coatings? Which has the, the highest infection risk? I'm going to tell you that this is kind of a trick question because the, I think the data is not completely consistent that there's a clear advantage. I think you'll find um, people who advocate coated catheters versus non-coated. Um, and we'll talk about that later in terms of, of uh, which is appropriate to use and under what circumstances would you want to use a coated catheter. Dr. Allen, sorry, coated with like antibiotics? With an antiseptic uh, agent or antimicrobial, some sort of antimicrobial barrier. So um, now those are typically associated with more short-term place lines like a, a CVC because um, pick lines and, and ports, they stay in for such a long duration of time, you really can't maintain that barrier for months. In a, but, but if you're keeping a CVC in for a week, then you can coat a catheter successfully. So um, these are some other risk factors for infection. Again, catheter thrombosis, usually an indication particularly, especially with septic thrombosis for catheter removal. 
Um, but you always want to suspect catheter thrombosis in someone who has catheter malfunction, who may have local signs of swelling, and screen for it. Uh, because one of the major causes of catheter thrombosis is, a, is, is infection. So keep that in mind. Repeated catheterization obviously incre increases inflammation. Increased catheter manipulation, sometimes by patients. Um, Dr. Green likes to talk about uh, the, our Moffitt patients who, um, you know, the, uh, oftentimes we have to remind them, don't let your pets lick your catheters or your wounds because, you know, someone goes home, they're experiencing cancer treatment, they, they want to have that um, reassurance from their pet. And we know that, that dogs aren't shy about licking their owners. So don't let them lick your catheters. That's a no-no. These are um, sources of infection to consider. Skin colonization. Um, some of our patients here at our facility, particularly the ones where you go in the room, maybe they have a history of psoriasis, maybe they have very dry skin, maybe they just have a lot of xerosis of their skin and their skin is hyperkeratotic. You wanna think of those patients as having higher possibility of skin colonization that will increase their risk of infection. Um, and uh, these infections tend to be the skin commensals, we all know, streptococci, coagulative staph and staph aureus. Um, intraluminal contamination, um, again, that's uh, along the catheter tract. That's more likely in prolonged or surgically implanted devices. Uh, we see a lot of, periodically at Moffitt, we'll see patients with tunnel infections with their catheters if they have a port or, or, a, um, or a Hickman line. Hematogenous seeding, again, all, all it takes is a bloodstream infection from a distant focus. Maybe they have a UTI, maybe they have a wound, um, you know, maybe they have a, uh, you know, a uh, loss of intact mucosal barrier, maybe they have a cholecystitis, for example, something that causes a bacteremia. Infusate contamination we talked about can be manufacturer related solution prep. Reflux is, um, does that, well, let me ask, does anybody know what reflux is in this setting? So reflux is when uh, you're, you're, infu you're infusing uh, some uh, medication and, uh, and, and the, you know, through uh, line management, the material actually refluxes back into the bag and contaminates it. So um, you have to take steps to avoid that. I don't know if that, is there any kind of one-way valve? Uh, I mean, under what circumstances is that physically possible, Amanda? Have you ever heard of that? I guess one possibility is you're transporting a patient and maybe you set the bag down from the IV pole and you know, with gravity, it actually contaminates it. So it's, you know, it's just simple physics. Remember that you wanna keep that uh, sterile bag free of contamination. All right, so what are the, um, what are the top pathogens that cause catheter-related bloodstream infections? Um, if you look at the top four, three of them are gram positives. That's important in terms of your empiric therapy, right? So uh, between the between coagulative staph, staph aureus, and enterococci, you're talking about 60% of the majority of, of uh, pathogens of, of bloodstream infections that are caused by those three organisms. And when you include candida, you're almost at 70%. So think about the big four in terms of coverage doesn't mean that you should always cover candida. There are some patients that have increased risk of a candida-associated bloodstream infection. In those cases, you want to cover uh, them for candidiasis. And then look at the remainder. They're all uh, enteric, uh, gram-negative rods, pseudomonas, uh, some more specific uh, resistant hospital pathogens like serratia and, and uh, acinetobacter. Um, these are kind of some oddballs. Stenotrophomonas, Think about that in oncology patients. Seems like we're seeing fewer, fewer uh, stenotrophomonas bacteremias at Moffitt. I, I, I attribute that really to good antimicrobial stewardship techniques um, because we used to see a lot more. Um, occasionally, Bacillus chronobacterium JK can cause infections. Um, MDR gram-negative bacilli uh, 
we want to think about in patients who are very antibiotic or hospital experienced and uh, think about uh, candida with hyperalimentation. You can have polymicrobial infections. We see that from time to time. What you don't often see is anaerobes causing central related or catheter related bloodstream infections. So those are, are not common. Think about pseudomonas in burn patients and think about uh, enteric uh, gram negative bacilli and, and uh, uh, gram negative rods in uh, patients with neutropenia and loss of mucosal barriers. All right, so we're gonna do a clinical case history. This is a 56 year old male patient with pancreatic cancer and uh, he had a Whipple procedure in the recent past, had a PICC line placed in the right antecubital fossa and started on TPN. Five days later, he develops a fever, 102.5. You see him and you notice that he has a uh, moderately swollen right upper extremity. The white blood cell count is 15,000. He is hemodynamically stable in the SICU. So what would the appropriate next interventions be? So how many people think that uh, we should obtain uh, blood cultures? Raise your hand if you think we should get blood cultures in this patient. Okay. How about a Doppler? Anybody go for a Doppler? Yeah. All right. How about uh, empiric antibiotic coverage? Okay. How about uh, removal of the PICC line? Not yet. Not yet? Okay. And how about a, a transesophageal echocardiogram? Not yet. Not yet. Okay. So I think there's a, a universal uh, agreement, it sounds like, in, in our audience with um, A, B, and C. Um, and D and E, you know, again, we, we want to consider more thoughtfully because um, we know that uh, pulling a pick line is not always necessary. It's not always necessary to pull the pick line. We want to get a better idea of what's going on in the right upper extremity um, before we consider that or um, a further workup for possibility of complications related to a, a bloodstream infection. And, uh, and we should keep in mind that uh, this patient um, doesn't have bacteremia documented as yet. So to follow up on that, you order blood cultures, uh, you write an order for a right upper, upper extremity Doppler, and you plan to start empiric antibiotics for a presumed catheter associated bloodstream infection. Now what organisms would you cover? Um, how many people say A, that's a gram positive cocci? How many people say B, yeast? Should we cover yeast, anybody? How about gram negative bacilli? How about anaerobes? So again, our astute audience uh, feels that uh, A is most appropriate. And indeed it is because remember our top three, our 60% of bloodstream infections are caused by gram, po gram positives. Um, now under the right circumstances that we'll talk about a little bit later, you might consider B as well or even C, but uh, for this patient, we thought A would be appropriate. All right, so um, what are some basic principles of the workup of a catheter-related bloodstream infection? This is a large number of the consults we get in infectious disease in hospital patients. How do we work these patients up? Well, there's a clinical assessment. There's an assessment based on microbiology, and, then, um, uh, and, and that includes uh, assessment of uh, both the blood and the catheter. So in terms of clinical manifestations, when do you suspect a catheter-related bloodstream infection? If you have fever or have a positive blood culture in the setting of someone with a central venous catheter and there's no apparent source. So think about that. Again, we should always, as part of our routine evaluation, assess patients for catheters. Um, you know, what, what's, what are they, what, what, how are they receiving their medications? and so forth. Um, also, do they have some local signs of infection at the insertion site? Are they hemodynamically unstable? You know, some of our um, elderly patients, the only signs that they have septicemia from a central catheter associated bloodstream infection, at least initially, may be altered mental status, right? Some of those patients don't really mount a fever. Or they're not necessarily likely to have marked leukocytosis. Um, Catheter dysfunction, are they having a, a catheter uh, obstruction, maybe uh, either b through blood draws or infusing into the catheter, or have they required some sort of catheter uh, 
uh, declotting procedure. Maybe they received an infusion and suddenly they, they develop signs of sepsis. Obviously, that would be concern you for maybe an infusate contamination issue. Um, or do they have bloodstream complications like thrombophlebitis, endocarditis, osteomyelitis, metastatic infection? So we all recognize that an important part of assessing central catheter-related bloodstream infections are blood cultures, right? So that's, that's probably the, one of the first interventions in terms of diagnostic studies. <clears throat> now, it's important that, uh, that ideally you obtain more than one set of blood cultures, right? Uh, and if you can, and if you can get samples from the catheter and peripheral vein, that's really important. That's gonna give you the broadest discerning power based on cultures. You wanna use the same volume of blood for each. Hopefully, the, the, you wanna label the bottles to reflect the collection site. I would have to say more often than not, when we review blood cultures in our facility, they're not often labeled, and that becomes kind of frustrating. Um, you want to use, uh, uh, you, you want to correlate what organisms come back with how likely they are to cause bloodstream infection. And as we said, the big three are Staph aureus, coagulative staph, Enterococcus, and Candida. Um, now, when you get, when someone draws a single blood culture just from the catheter, that's probably the most difficult type of situation to discern. Again, just because you have a positive blood culture from, single blood culture from a central catheter, doesn't mean you have a, uh, a central, a, I should say a catheter-related bloodstream infection, right? Because you can't really discern the difference between catheter colonization, catheter infection, and a catheter-related bloodstream infection just by a single culture from a central venous catheter. There, you don't have the discerning power, and that's why you need a second culture peripherally. Obviously, if you, um, if you get the identical organism growing from both a peripheral blood culture and a central catheter-associated blood culture, that has the highest discerning power. And there's some additional um, definitions that actually increase the likelihood that it's a catheter-related infection as well that we'll get into um, in just a moment. Now, um, both types of cultures have excellent negative predict predictive values, right? So if you do a blood culture from a central catheter and it's negative, it's probably going to suggest that none of those things are present. The patient doesn't have uh, catheter colonization, the patient doesn't have a catheter infection, and the patient's unlikely to have bacteremia, right? Because chances are you would detect it. So the negative predictive value is greater in, in those circumstances. Um, and one thing for sure, dedicated phlebotomy teams can reduce contamination rates. And, and uh, it's a continual challenge at our facility to make sure that um, you know, we, we keep our rate of contamination at the lowest level possible, particularly in areas of the hospital where um, you know, blood cultures have to be done in a very expedient manner and there's less attention to sterile techniques. Um, so, what are the microbiologic criteria for the diagnosis of a catheter-related bloodstream infection? As we said, culture of the same organism from both the catheter tip um, or, the, or the, an actual positive blood culture obtained through that device and at least one percutaneously obtained blood culture, right? Those are, those are the definitions. Um, so, either a catheter tip culture that's positive and a peripheral that's positive or two positive blood cultures, one from the line and one from a peripheral site. In addition, there's some uh, microbiologic definitions for uh, catheter-related bloodstream infection. A quantitative blood culture, that's one where a colony count from the catheter hub is greater than or equal to threefold higher than a colony count from a peripheral vein sample. That's called a positive, that, that the patient has, has positive quantitative blood cultures. Um, there's also semi-quantitative blood cultures. That's when you just have greater than 15 colony forming units of the same microbe from the insertion site, hub site, and a peripheral blood sample. 
Now, in many cases, uh, most labs, that's a t both of those are time consuming and they don't often get reported. So really the third on this list, the differential time to positivity is probably the most practical definition. And that's growth detected from a blood culture from a catheter hub sample that occurs at least two hours before the growth from a peripheral blood sample. So this is something that all of us can look at. If we get positive blood cultures and the catheter hub sample, hopefully it's labeled, comes back as positive at least two hours before the peripheral one does, then that by definition is a positive DTP, a positive differential time to positivity. So um, we get a lot of questions about a single positive blood culture for coag-negative staph, right? So what do you do with those? And I think throughout the year, the house staff catches on and we get less consults about it. But, you know, we're all learning at this early time of the year. So we do get a lot of questions about this. Um, we treat a single positive blood culture for, for coag-negative staph as a contaminant. We usually recommend repeat blood cultures um, we want to make sure we obtain the cultures through the suspected catheter and a peripheral site. Um, and in most cases with uh, coag negative staph positive blood cultures, it's not critical to remove the device unless there's persistent positive blood cultures or you have a compelling reason to believe that the patient's infection is not going to improve uh, without device removal. Uh, this is one such circumstance where antibiotic lock therapy may be useful. Now, for those of you who haven't heard about that, I will touch on it later. Um, so catheter tip cultures um, should be performed upon catheter removal when infection suspected. Um, this is something a lot of people don't know. If your CVL is less than seven days, it actually helps to culture the intradermal portion. That's the portion that uh, um, connects the catheter through the skin because that's most likely to be infected if it's greater than seven days, if it's greater than seven to 10 days, then the catheter tip. Those are for CVLs, right? Triple lumen catheters. Uh, tunnel catheters, you wanna culture the tip at any age. And I put uh, diagnostic criteria there, of course, for uh, catheter tip cultures, greater than 15 colony forming units from a five centimeter segment of the catheter tip by roll plate culture. Um, and, uh, or, or a qualitative broth culture of greater than 10 to the three colony forming units from a sonicated catheter by broth culture. These are important for microbiology labs to know, and they usually report them to us. Um, this is an important uh, a tenet of, of catheter management. Do not treat a positive cap tip culture in the absence of bacteremia. Sometimes we get questions about that. Hey, I pulled the, ca the catheter on this patient and it's coming back with uh, E. coli. Should I treat this? Um, in the absence of bacteremia, generally not. The exception is Staph aureus. Sometimes, again, Staph aureus is a, uh, a huge sort of a gorilla in the management of central venous catheter infections. If someone's catheter tip is colonized with Staph aureus, again, you wanna look at that case more closely. And in many cases, you wanna treat them for seven days with uh, anti-staphylococcal therapy. Um, so these are further management considerations. When do you treat and when do you not to, to, to treat? How do you manage the catheter device? And what type of therapy do you use? So systemic therapy is not required. When do we not need to treat patients? If there's a positive catheter tip culture and no evidence of bacteremia, no evidence of Per, of uh, systemic infection, ignore that. Um, positive blood cultures obtained through a catheter with negative cultures through a peripheral vein. Let's say you, um, you get a blood, someone on the medicine service gets a blood culture from a, uh, a CVL and it grows Klebsiella, uh, but a peripheral blood culture is also done and that's negative. Should that be treated? Um, not for, uh, most bacteria, there are a few exceptions, right? Staph aureus, Pseudomonas, and Candida, you generally want to treat. But other pathogens, no. You know, there's no need to treat. And there's no need to pull the catheter either. Now, 
if someone's showing peripheral signs of infection, if they look septic, that's a different matter, but we're talking about an asymptomatic patient. What are, indication, what are indications to remove a catheter? Severe sepsis, hemodynamic instability, endocarditis, persistent bacteremia, um, and, and infections with certain organisms that are hard to eradicate without device removal, right? Very sticky organisms like Staph aureus, Enterococci, Pseudomonas, Mycobacteria, and, uh, and fungi. Um, occasionally we get uh, catheters that are positive for Bacillus, Micrococcus, um, or Propionobacterium. Um, even though they're low virulence, they're difficult to eradicate without catheter removal. So sometimes you have to consider that. Um, we don't need to routinely remove all catheters and FUOs. Um, again, that's, um, that's not necessarily necessary. You do want to consider catheter exchange if by the process of elimination you determine there's no other potential source, but not as an initial strategy. And um, if you can salvage a catheter potentially, um, again, there's some potential for additional morbidity that's saved. Um, because we all know that catheter replacement is not risk-free. Um, when do you exchange catheters over a guide wire? Um, when catheter removal is necessary, there's no sepsis, and there's increased uh, risk of complications with reinsertion. Um, and I touched on this earlier. The reason um, why antimicrobial impregnated catheters, the data is just not there is because I think there's a feeling that with standard catheters, you can keep infection rates low at reduced cost just by um, instituting sterile placement techniques and good catheter management. So should you spend uh, So should you should you spend $125 on a coated catheter when you can spend $40 on a non-coated catheter and have the same infection rates just by um, using good catheter care and um, good placement techniques? Obviously, it's obvious the answer is no. Also, you don't want to be lulled into a false sense of complacency that a coated catheter is going to save the day, right? Just because the catheter is coated, you don't need to do any of those things. So that's why it's controversial. Oh, and also there's no evidence in favor of the routine exchange of intravascular catheters. I think we all know that, right? You don't, want to, you don't need to change your central line every seven days. Um, well, I'm going, to, I'm going to try to, I have about 15 minutes, so now I'm going to cover specific organisms. Um, we know that the big four, right, are gram positives and candida. So when you give your empiric antibiotic coverage, vancomycin is the likely initial therapy, right? If you have a patient with neutropenia or sepsis, obviously those patients are at higher risk for gram-negative bacilli like pseudomonas, resistant gram-negative rods. Also, you want to look at the patient's history, right? If they've had past infections with VRE or uh, resistant gram-negative bacilli, you know, some of these patients we manage at Moffitt, then you want to broaden that coverage. But in general, for the non-neutropenic patient, vancomycin is okay for empiric therapy um, under most circumstances. In the, in, in the neutropenic patient, you want to think about adding gram-negative coverage, obviously. And um, candidemia, what are, when do you cover for candidemia, as I've listed there? Someone on TPN, someone on prolonged broad-spectrum antibiotics, maybe somebody who has persistently cultured out candida from different body sites under circumstances of being on prolonged antibiotics in the intensive care unit, um, someone with a hematologic malignancy, uh, a stem cell transplant or solid organ transplant patient, someone with a femoral catheter, and femoral catheters are the bane of our existence as infectious disease doctors. And unfortunately, it seems like these days we're seeing more of them, especially in our intensive care units. Or, uh, as I said, colonization at multiple sites. Coag negative staph, uh, most common cause of of catheter-related bloodstream infections. Um, if you isolate it from multiple sites, that's a risk factor for true uh, infection. Um, what are the treatment options? In some patients, uh, the guidelines suggest uh, 
just pull the catheter if it's not needed. And that's all the, you know, and, and then additional antibiotic therapy for seven days is kind of optional, although many people may consider that. Um, some, a lot of people try to salvage the catheter with coagulated staph and treat them with two weeks of vancomycin or uh, an, an, another antibiotic therapy, see if the bacteremia recurs, save them the potential for increased morbidity from line exchange, particularly if they have an implanted catheter, right? Someone with a Hickman or a, or a port. And um, in, in contradistinction, if you have someone with persistent positive blood cultures, maybe somebody with endovascular hardware, negative TEE, many providers would treat for longer, perhaps three weeks. And if you have somebody with endocarditis, obviously six weeks. Staph aureus, this is uh, one of the pathogens where catheter removal is, man is usually mandatory. Um, you, you can replace the catheter when a repeat blood culture is negative at 72 hours. Um, there's no real evidence-based guidelines for, dura for length of therapy, um, but uh, many clinicians in an uncomplicated case would treat for two weeks, up to six weeks, depending on uh, whether this is a complicated infection. Uh, now, it may surprise some of you to know that in about almost a third of cases, Staph aureus bacteremia secondary to a catheter-related bloodstream infection is associated with endocarditis. And that's why we, generally speaking, like to screen for it, particularly in patients on dialysis, patients with prosthetic devices, patient with, patients with persistently positive blood cultures. Those are all high-risk patients for endocarditis. Um, and uh, uh, TE is usually recommended, um, particularly uh, in, in cases where uh, it's been more than five to seven days after the bacteremia started. Um, and uh, a lot of these patients may end up requiring management with the prolonged therapy for endocarditis. Um, these are risk factors for hematogenous complications. Periodically, we'll see a patient with uh, MRSA uh, bacteremia coming from the community with no um, associated risk factors those patients are very concerning for endocarditis. You know, somebody comes from the community, they have a bacteremia, nobody knows why. There's usually something going on there. Um, valvular heart disease, hemodialysis, as I said. Um, and uh, persistent or prolonged bacteremia increases the risk of, dis of a distant focus, especially after catheter removal. Enterococcus is a sticky bug. Um, so for that reason, usually catheter removal is required. I have seen some cases, however, particularly with VRE, because remember, VRE is a less virulent pathogen than, than uh, vancomycin susceptible or AMP susceptible enterococcus fecalis. So I have seen some cases over at Moffitt, a patient with an implanted port where maybe they're not really good candidates for port removal and replacement because they're having prolonged neutropenia. Where the port device is not removed, at least initially, and we try to treat uh, the VRE infection with antibiotic therapy. I can't always tell you that that's successful from a long-term standpoint, but um, you know, we, we ha sometimes we have to consider these cases individually. Um, and uh, ampicillin is the antibiotic of choice for certainly for fecalis, uh, vancomycin, penicillin allergy, uh, Zyvox or Dapto are alternatives. Um, and uh, so how long do you treat these infections? It's perhaps less clear. Uh, you know, more recently for endocarditis with enterococcus fecalis, we've used more AMP ceftriaxin than AMP gen genomycin for uh, safety and tolerability issues. So it's unclear if this extends to bacteremias, uh, complicated bacteremias, but it may, it may be something to consider. Gram-negative rods. Um, because of endotoxemia, empiric antibiotic therapy is always recommended. Um, but uh, if you have somebody with the risk for MDR infections, you need to escalate your coverage. Um, do you use a single agent or combination empiric therapy? Uh, remember that for Pseudomonas, uh, if, you, if you're unclear of susceptibilities, it's okay to treat them with two agents initially, depending on severity of illness and then to ta taper that back. But for most gram-negative infections, uh, single-agent therapy, if it's, if it's felt to be reliable, is acceptable. Um, 
In Canada, we always remove the catheter. We typically start with an aconitacanid and then de-escalate to an azole, right? I think we all know that intuitively. Um, Chronobacterium and bacillus and micrococcus, and many of you may be aware that micrococcus has now been sub-differentiated to cocuria, uh, nestor and conia, chytococcus, and dermococcus. So if you see any of those organisms, that's formerly micrococcus. Um, we, usually we want to document at least two positive blood cultures, and it usually requires catheter removal, and it's treated with vanco. Um, how about uh, catheter colonization? Um, this can occur, and it requires close monitoring. If you have somebody who's persistently having a positive blood culture out of their catheter, but not, not peripherally, and they're asymptomatic, and it's a, it's a less virulent organism, a lot of times those patients can be, just be monitored. Um, or you may want to consider antibiotic lock therapy for them, which I'll go into in a minute. Um, treatment duration for those, for in general, we know for catheter-related infections, I've listed there 10 to 14 days after negative cultures, four to six weeks if complications occur. All right, so I've been mentioning antibiotic lock therapy, right? So the principles of antibiotic lock therapy are that if you, if you infuse a hyper-concentrated solution of an antibiotic into the catheter lumen, and, and quote unquote lock it there for a period of time, that um, direct uh, topical um, exposure to a uh, concentrated solution of a acceptable antimicrobial <coughs> may be enough to kill organisms within the biofilm. So this is useful for lower virulence organisms. Again, nobody's gonna try this for Staph aureus, but if you have a Staph epi, for example, or if you have a gram-negative bacillus, um, it, it's, it's worth a try, and sometimes it's given in combination with systemic antibiotic therapy, usually for seven days, but I've, it's typically where I've seen it, but sometimes for 14 days. And uh, you don't want to use it for infections due to Staph aureus, Pseudomonas, drug-resistant pathogens, or Candida, but there may be other pathogens that are less virulent where this is an effective technique that preserves your catheter. So Amanda, how, long, how many times have we used this in the last year? I'm guessing you're gonna say zero, right? Well, we actually used it once. Oh, okay, cool. Yeah. So, yeah. so there are limited, circum there, there may be circumstances where it's worth a try, right? If you have somebody, because let's face it, some of our patients with hemodialysis or other complications, they don't have any other sites to put a catheter in. Let's say they have a port and that's it. And if they can't have the port removed, we, we've got to try, we got to pull out, you know, kind of reach down deep into our bag of tricks, pull it out and, and try that. And that's the circumstances that we may want to consider. Um, now, there have been um, reported cases of complications, even a case of a sensory neural hearing loss with an amicase and heparin lock. So we have to consider these cases carefully, but um, they, it, it is something to consider. I'm going to briefly touch on, because we have five minutes, touch on uh, uh, local site infections. We want to differentiate two different phenomena here. These are insertion site infections and exit site infections, right? So what are the difference? Well, many of you may know, when you put in a, let's say a Hickman catheter, if you've ever seen these done, there's an insertion site and an exit site, right? The insertion site is usually the site that's right next to the, the, um, uh, the clavicle. Um, where the uh, surgeon initially cannulates the vein. And then he takes the catheter and he, he creates a tunnel that goes to the exit site. So the exit site, once the, the, imp, the tunnel catheter is placed, is where the catheter comes out. The insertion site is where the uh, catheter uh, placer initially cannulated the vein. So where the insertion site goes in, that has the shortest distance to the vessel, and the insertion site is at the distal end of the tunnel. So when you have exit site infections, those can be managed topically because they're at the end of the tunnel. When you have an insertion site infection, 
those are more serious. And usually in freshly implanted catheters, you can see an incision here right where the insertion site is. Um, so insertion site infections much closer to where the, the vein is, where the cannulation occurs, those are more serious. Usually require systemic um, uh, therapy or potentially even device removal. Exit site infections, because they're um, uh, you know, distal to the tunnel, can usually be uh, treated with topical therapy or even um, some PO antibiotic therapy to clear them up. Um, thrombophlebitis I'll touch on. Uh, again, you can treat uncomplicated cases with warm soaks and elevation. However, septic thrombophlebitis, uh, infection of a septic clot associated with a catheter, can often be associated with bacteremia and requires device removal. So what do you all think about this catheter? I, I'm seeing a, just a little bit of redness along the tunnel site um, in addition to the exit site here. So I don't know if I, if I looked at this catheter, I would necessarily remove it, but I would definitely watch it closely. And in the setting of systemic signs of infection, I would be concerned. Um, but sometimes patients have catheters placed, there's some irritation, they rub the site, or um, it, it needs a few days for the inflammation to die down. And so uh, sometimes patients will, will have. So I'm gonna close just by saying that uh, there's a lot that we can do to prevent catheter-related infections. Obviously, maximum sterile barriers when placing. Um, choose appropriate insertion sites. Really be an advocate against placement of ephemeral line. Those are the highest risk of infection. Um, ex an experienced catheter placement team has the lowest risk of infection. Catheter material really is a little more controversial. Daily inspection and reassessment. And then, um, although there is no need to routinely exchange catheters, there is a need to uh, monitor the continued need for a catheter on a daily basis and when they're no longer needed to remove them, right? We can all acknowledge that. And this is the IHI bundle for evidence-based components uh, of how to reduce um, catheter infections. Hand hygiene, maximum barrier precautions, skin prep, optimal catheter site selection, and daily review of line necessity. Is that, what, is that graph, is that sage? It looks like a little, uh, it's a little bundle of firewood. Uh, last worst case scenario, you just burn some <laughs> over the patient if nothing else is working. Sometimes if nothing else is working, you gotta go with that. All right, well, I have uh, finished right on time. Um, I'll stay outside for any questions. Thank you all very much.